this week's episode of the Age of Revolution podcast, we resume our reading of Fateful Lightning by William Hillenbrand, moving from a broad overview of the origins of the American Civil War to the particulars of the various military evolutions and their consequences. Leading us off is the whistle tune Gary Owen, performed here by Dennis Kennedy, a song that evokes something of the boisterous spirit that accompanied the war's opening preparations. We begin now with a chapter titled, To the Drum Taps Prompt. To the drum taps prompt, the young men falling in and arming, squads gather everywhere by common consent and arm. From Drum Taps by Walt Whitman. War, theorized the Prussian Karl von Clausewitz, is in essence a political act, the extension of political struggle by other means. This principle is particularly true of the American Civil War because it was a struggle of two popular democracies. At the outset of the war, the Southern Confederacy appealed to the right of revolution expressed in the Declaration of Independence. The Union appealed to the principle of perpetual union expressed in the Constitution. Though both parties knew that the issue of slavery was somehow the inciting cause of the conflict, Neither officially articulated war aims in terms of slavery in the first year of the war. In a trial by fire, the nation was going to determine, as Lincoln put it, whether there could be a successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet. North and South had been talking about just such a trial for a generation. Neither side, however, was at all prepared to prosecute the war that had been threatened so long. Americans had nurtured from their beginning a deep distrust of a standing army, believing it a danger to Republican government. In 1860, a nation whose population was nearing 30 million fielded a regular army of slightly more than 16,000 officers and men. Most of these were scattered across three million square miles of the Trans-Mississippi West. It was a force hardly adequate to keep in check the western tribes secure the emigrant trails, and garrison a hundred-odd forts and posts. As historian James McPherson points out, the regular army had nothing resembling a general staff, no strategic plans, no program for mobilization. Only two officers had ever commanded as much as a brigade in combat, and they were both over seventy. The United States Navy was hardly better prepared. Although it had forty-two ships in service, Most of these were on the high seas. Less than a dozen warships were ready to cruise the vast reaches of America's own coast. In fact, so unprepared for war was the United States that in the first days of the conflict the capital itself was virtually isolated and undefended. Lincoln's call to arms after the fall of Sumter had driven the four states of the Upper South, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia, to join their sisters in the Lower South. With slaveholding and secession-minded Maryland north of the Potomac and Virginia south of it, Washington endured ten anxious April days before the first regiments from Massachusetts and New York relieved the city. In Washington, then, the government was committed to the suppression of a rebellion. In Montgomery, Alabama, very briefly the Confederate capital, the government was determined to secure the independence it had proclaimed. Neither side had the means at hand to achieve its end. After the fall of Sumter, Lincoln called for 75,000 90-day volunteers and a month later for 42,000 three-year men. These were to be raised by the state's militia systems and then sworn into federal service. Under the existing militia system, however, the task would prove enormous. Except for the brief, fitful outbursts of the 1812 war and the Mexican war, the country had enjoyed a half-century of peace, which had bred a generally incompetent complacency, with annual militia musters having much more the air of a country fair than a military exercise. In the outpouring of pent-up energies after Sumter, Lincoln could find many willing hands to do the government's work far more than the 75,000 he initially asked for. In 
The problem was that the militia, officers and men alike, brought a great deal of energy, but precious little useful training or experience. Thus the larger problem was what to do with this mass of men once they came into federal service. The task of organizing, training, arming, and equipping a force this large was in the spring of 61 utterly beyond the government's immediate power to accomplish efficiently or effectively. In the South, Jefferson Davis was in the same headlong rush to raise an army and was in fact a step or two ahead of the Northern mobilization. By many lights, certainly his own, Davis looked the ideal choice to engineer such an effort. A West Pointer, he had seen service in the Black Hawk War and the Mexican War, and had been a capable Secretary of War to President Franklin Pierce. Davis had called on the states for 100,000 militiamen more than a month before Lincoln's call, and it may be that the Southern militia system incited by John Brown's raid was in a somewhat higher state of readiness than its northern counterpart. The South was, however, even less prepared to feed, clothe, arm, and equip these thousands of eager warriors than was the North. Although the South produced more than enough food, it lagged vastly behind in the capacity to produce all the varied materiel of war its armies required. At the outset of the struggle, the South had just one-ninth of the industrial capacity of the North. Eventually, the Confederate Ordnance Bureau, directed by a little-known genius, Josias Gorgias, would succeed in arming Southern forces effectively, but the rebel soldier from beginning to end would be ill-clothed, ill-shod, and ill-equipped, and finally, from the failure of the South's transportation system, ill-fed. Still, by the end of April, 60,000 men were, if not exactly under arms, at least enrolled in the Confederate States Army. Although inefficiency, incompetence, and confusion reigned in both camps, North and South were swiftly raising the hosts of war. The kind of armies they raised says much about the political culture they shared. From first to last, the private soldier, North and South, never forgot that he was, like his forefathers, a citizen soldier, and always a citizen first. It was an attitude that made turning him into a disciplined soldier a patient and demanding business. An Indiana trooper spoke for his comrades in all the Federal armies. We had enlisted to put down the rebellion and had no patience with the red tape tomfoolery of the regular service. Furthermore, our boys recognized no superiority except in the line of legitimate duty. Shoulder straps waved, a private was ready at the drop of a hat to thrash his commander a feat that occurred more than once. His rebel counterpart was, if anything, more anti-authoritarian. A Georgia private complained bitterly, We have tight rules over us. The order was read out in dress parade the other day that we all had to pull off our hats when we go to the colonel or general. I would rather see him in hell before I will pull my hat off to any man. Compounding this independence of mind was the fact that, early in the war at least, units elected their own officers, both at the company and regimental level. Given the inexperience of both electors and elected, the practice led inevitably to a good deal of dangerous incompetence. The testimony of a Pennsylvania soldier characterizing his regiment's commander might be repeated a thousand times. Colonel Roberts has showed himself to be ignorant of the simplest company movements. There is a total lack of system about our regiment. Nothing is attended to at the proper time. Nobody looks ahead to the morrow. We can justly be called a mob and one not fit to face the enemy. And so the hosts gathered that spring of 1861 from every class and calling, bearing colorful names and wearing improbable uniforms. New York's Zouaves marched into Washington in baggy red breeches and purple tunics topped with a red fez. Georgia raccoon ruffs marched into Atlanta utterly undisciplined and undrilled. No two kept the same step. No two wore the same colored coat or trousers. The only pretense at uniformity was the rough fur caps, 
with long bushy streaked raccoon tails hanging behind them. Youthful and eager they came, the Lone Star Rifles, South Florida Bulldogs, New York Highlanders, Dixie Invincibles, Susquehanna Blues, Jasper Rifles, Cherokee Lincoln Killers, Rough and Ready Grays. Ethnic regiments came forward primarily but not exclusively into Federal armies, the St. Patrick Brigade, Garibaldi Guards, German Rifles. Into the camps they came, clerks and college professors, bowery toughs and plowboys, mechanics and merchants. There they would learn how to lay out a company street properly, perform the manual of arms, and drill by company and by regiment. By daylight the private was learning to load by nines, while his captain studied Hardy's tactics by candlelight to prepare for the next day's drill. For the eastern armies of north and south, the first battle of Bull Run was just two months away. When it came on that sultry July day, they would not quite be armed mobs, as the Prussian von Moltke is supposed to have called them, but neither would they quite be armies. The general-in-chief of the gathering Federal armies was Winfield Scott. He had been a bold and brilliant commander in the Mexican War, capturing Mexico City in a campaign that the Duke of Wellington thought the greatest in modern times. But by 1861 Scott was ancient and ailing, too ponderous even to mount a horse any more. Although old fuss and feathers, as he was called for his pompous manner, was well past his prime as a field commander, he saw some things more clearly than most in the first spring of the war. First, he was sure that the ninety-day regiments were of only marginal value, and that the three-year men were months of training away from being an effective fighting force. Second, he saw the real magnitude of the task of suppressing the rebellion. While the popular press, both north and south, wrote blithely about swift and glorious victory, Scott knew that subduing the south would require vast armies and navies and a long and terrible struggle. In fact, the conqueror of Mexico City had little appetite for a war of conquest against the South. Instead, he proposed a plan to envelop the South by taking control of the Mississippi River and blockading her coasts. Thus isolated, he argued, the South could be brought to terms with less bloodshed than by any other plan. Scott's plan, derisively called the Anaconda Plan by the Northern Press, was on the face of it a good one. Its key objectives, control of the Mississippi and an effective blockade, would eventually become two central elements of the North's emerging strategy. But in a democracy at war, purely military considerations are never purely military. Scott argued for thorough and thoughtful preparation, and urged Lincoln to resist the impatience of our patriotic and loyal Union friends, who demanded instant and vigorous action, regardless of the consequences. But the clamor of northern public opinion and a fervid press became a call that neither Scott nor Lincoln could resist. What made the call irresistible was that it came from the people themselves in a sudden outpouring of pent-up emotion. Cities, towns, and villages turned out for war meetings. In New York City's Union Square, 100,000 gathered around the statue of Washington and shouted for an immediate and crushing invasion of the South. At Oberlin College, a student remembered, War and volunteers are the only topic of conversation or thought. Young men turned out to enlist in numbers that overwhelmed the recruiting offices and the capacity of the states to organize them. Walt Whitman, the great poet of the people, understood that war fever was transforming the North. An armed race is advancing, he wrote, welcome for battle. In parades and rallies, in church services and schools, the theme was universal. The time had come to trust in the God of battles. As it happened, the precise timetable for battle was actually determined in part by the press. With Virginia's secession, the Confederate government voted to make Richmond its capital and scheduled its first congressional session to meet there on July 20, 1861. 
Horace Greeley's New York Tribune announced this news with the following headline, Forward to Richmond! Forward to Richmond! Rebel Congress must not be allowed to meet there on the 20th of July. By that date, the place must be held by the National Army. When newspapers all over the North began echoing on to Richmond, the pressure on Lincoln and his war cabinet to take the offensive in Virginia mounted steadily. The government failed to act, some argued, because Lincoln was wholly unequal to the crisis. Scott himself, others hinted darkly, was after all a native Virginian and perhaps a traitor to his own government. From the people in the press came a daily cry for aggressive action. In the end, Lincoln turned to General Irvin McDowell and told him to see what might be accomplished against the Confederate army gathered around Manassas Junction. General McDowell commanded what was then called the Department of Northeastern Virginia and made its headquarters at Arlington, until very recently the residence of Colonel and Mrs. Robert E. Lee. McDowell was a West Pointer who had served competently on Winfield Scott's staff, and although he had never held a field command, he had earned the respect of his colleagues for his energy and intelligence. He was a strange personality in some ways. He was, for example, gluttonous about food while absolutely abstemious about coffee, tea, tobacco, and alcohol. Once, when stunned in a fall from a horse, he had, even unconscious, clenched his teeth tightly to prevent a surgeon from reviving him with brandy. But whatever his quirks, he was probably as good a choice as Lincoln could have made, and McDowell might have had better luck than he did. By the end of June, McDowell commanded about 35,000 federal troops in the Washington area and had orders to use them against the Confederate forces gathered 25 miles southwest in and around Manassas Junction. As far as McDowell was concerned, he had a perfectly good plan, a proposal to strike Beauregard by flank attack, but no proper army to execute it. On June 29th, in conference at the White House, he said simply, this is not an army. It will take a long time to make an army. He urged Lincoln to delay at least long enough to train the three-year volunteers. Winfield Scott didn't want to fight on the Virginia front at all. He argued for his anaconda plan and an expedition down the Mississippi to New Orleans in the fall. But Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs put a hard and simple reality on the table. I do not think we would ever end the war without beating the rebels. It is better to whip them here. Lincoln was persuaded. Although he had no firm intelligence about the fitness of the Confederate forces, he supposed they could be no better prepared for battle than his own. Thus, on July 16th, four days before the Confederate Congress was to meet in Richmond, McDowell started his 35,000 recruits down the hot, dusty roads that led to Manassas. At Manassas, 20,000 Confederates were gathered under the command of Pierre G. T. Beauregard, the handsome Louisiana Creole already famous for the conquest of Fort Sumter. Like many of his fellow officers on both sides, Beauregard liked to strike Napoleonic poses and had a Napoleonic confidence to go with both the poses and his early success. Even as McDowell was making his plans, Beauregard, McDowell's classmate at West Point, was eager to be attacked. If I could only get the enemy to attack me, I would stake my reputation on the handsomest victory that could be hoped for. Not far away, in the Shenandoah Valley, was General Joseph Eggleston Johnston, with a force of about 11,000. If Johnston's force from the valley could join Beauregard's in time to strike McDowell together, Beauregard had an excellent chance to win his handsome victory. The task of keeping Johnston in the valley fell to General Robert Patterson, and here the Federals made their first fateful misstep. Patterson had led volunteers capably in both the War of 1812 and in Mexico, but at age 69 he was past his prime. Still, he might have been better served by clearer direction from that other old soldier from the Mexican War, General-in-Chief Winfield Scott. 
Patterson's 14,000 troops were camped around Hagerstown, Maryland, and Patterson understood that he was to use them to keep Johnston at bay. What Patterson did not understand was precisely how he should accomplish that end. Scott had told him to maneuver against Johnston, but at the same time not to risk his command in a pitched battle. In the end, about all the fighting Patterson did was a brief skirmish against Johnston's flamboyant cavalryman, Jeb Stewart, around Bunker Hill, Virginia. Then, thoroughly confused by Stewart's faint and Scott's ambiguous orders, and properly worried about his ninety-day men whose time was nearly up, Patterson withdrew toward Charlestown. By July 19th, he had maneuvered to a position twenty miles from the main body of Johnston's army. Johnston knew a good chance when he saw one and seized it immediately. From Winchester, he marched down to the railroad at Piedmont and put his men on cars headed for Manassas. At this point, McDowell had time to reach Manassas and fight Beauregard before the latter could be reinforced. The Confederates were, after all, just 25 miles away. But as he told Lincoln, his force was not an army, and its first hard march would prove it. Later in the war, when officers and men had learned their trade, troops would make such a march from dawn to dark. On this march, though, there would be a good deal of cheering and martial music, but not a good deal of progress. McDowell has been justly called a hard-luck general. Although he had never held a field command, he was leading now the largest army ever assembled on the continent. In his army were regiments he had never seen, soldiers who had never fired a musket, commanders of regiments who had never maneuvered in a brigade. The Pennsylvania soldier who described his regiment as a mob unfit for battle would find his judgment generally confirmed throughout the Federal Army. In the fierce July heat and the dust of an army on the march, soldiers fell out of column to draw water, pick blackberries, and boil coffee. Some raided gardens, stole chickens, looted empty houses. The first shots of the Battle of Bull Run were fired at unlucky hogs along the line of march. Regiments strung out and straggled, or worse, stood sweating in line while traffic ahead was sorted out. It took an entire day for the head of McDowell's column to reach Fairfax Courthouse. On the second day of the march, his army was already so worn it made just six more miles to Centerville. While McDowell was making his laborious way down to Manassas, Beauregard was putting his time to good use. He had been seasonably informed of the Union advance by the good offices of Rose O'Neill Greenhow, Washington socialite and Confederate spy. Although the Washington newspapers were nearly as informative as a whole network of spies. Beauregard drew his 20,000 up in an eight-mile arc on the west bank of a sluggish, wooded creek named Bull Run. When the collision came, Beauregard would have at least two advantages. First, his army hadn't been three fiercely hot days on the march to reach the fight. And second, it would do most of its fighting on the defensive, an easier business for green troops to manage. The initial collision of the two armies facing each other across Bull Run came on July 18th, when lead elements of McDowell's army under Brigadier General Daniel Tyler reached Centerville and found abandoned Confederate trenches. Bull Run was just two miles ahead to the southwest, and Tyler sent a brigade forward to see if it were held in force. Near Blackburn's Ford, Tyler encountered a line of Confederate infantry supported by artillery, and a sharp little skirmish ensued. The brigade lost eighty men in the fighting, and as an evil omen of things to come for the Federals, Tyler saw one of his militia regiments break in panic and go streaming back to Centerville. McDowell called a halt and spent the next two days getting the rest of his army to the field and examining the Confederate line. McDowell's plan was perfectly sensible, and if he could have got it in motion a little sooner, it had every chance to succeed, and very nearly did. McDowell would faint at the rebel right to make a demonstration at the Stone Bridge. The real effort would be on their left. His main body, 10,000 strong in two divisions, 
would march two miles upstream, cross Bull Run at Sudley Springs Ford, and come smashing down the Sudley Road toward the Warrenton Turnpike. As it happened, however, Beauregard hadn't planned to wait to be struck. He had a flank attack in mind himself, striking at McDowell's left. Had the attacks actually got off together, the two armies might have swung around like a gate eight miles wide. But McDowell, despite delay and confusion, got off first. At 2 a.m. on July 21st, the Union commander roused his sleeping army. The attacking column made a six-mile march through the dark underbrush, and by 9.30 most of David Hunter's 2nd and Samuel P. Heintzelman's 3rd Division were across Bull Run at Sudley Springs, where there were virtually no Confederates to receive them. About 7 a.m., Tyler's division went forward to make its demonstration at the Stone Bridge, and one brigade of Colonel D. S. Miles' division fainted toward Blackburn's Ford. The demonstration, however, was mainly a slow, steady cannonade that made a good deal of noise but failed to convince anyone that McDowell intended to strike at the bridge. The bridge was defended by a South Carolina West Pointer, Colonel Nathan G. Evans, nicknamed Shanks for his spindly legs. In the old army, Evans had earned a reputation as a hard-drinking, hard-driving dragoon. Today he commanded two regiments of infantry, some cavalry, and a few guns in front of the stone bridge, where he believed nothing important was going to happen. Upstream to his left, the important things were going to happen. One of the few Confederates in the area was a captain of engineers, Edward Porter Alexander, who had been abruptly awakened that morning when one of the first shells of Tyler's brigade tore through his tent. When Alexander saw the Federal column advancing, he immediately understood the danger to the Confederate left, and just as immediately communicated the danger to Evans at the Stone Bridge. Leaving four companies to guard the bridge, Evans hurried to the left with the rest of his command and two cannons, about a thousand men in all. When the lead elements of McDowell's attacking column, four regiments under the magnificently whiskered Ambrose E. Burnside, finally got moving down the Sudley Road about mid-morning, they found Evans drawn up a little north of the Warrenton Pike and prepared to contest its passage. Burnside's regiments outnumbered the Confederates, but of course it was the first time virtually all of his men had heard a shot fired in anger. They made two uncoordinated and not very determined attacks and fell back in disorder, done for the day. But as Burnside's men withdrew, fresh troops of Colonel Heintzelman's division came up and continued to press Evans, whose command was now in danger of falling apart. To Beauregard on Lookout Hill near Mitchell's Ford, he called for help. But before Beauregard could respond, help reached Evans in the form of Brigadier General Barnard B., who had come on the run on his own initiative. B.'s brigade had been in the valley with Joe Johnston, but had got off the cars at Manassas Junction in time to double-quick up the Sudley Road and confront the Federal advance. McDowell, however, was handling his Green Army skillfully thus far. From the ford at Sudley Springs he fed more of his attacking column into the fight against B. and Evans, maintaining a punishing pressure on the Confederate left. To Tyler at the Stone Bridge he sent word to try to force a crossing, one of Tyler's brigades, led by a man who would make a name for himself as a remorseless fighter, Colonel William T. Sherman, got across the stream about a half mile above the bridge and fell in on McDowell's left. Joined by other regiments of Tyler's command, Sherman's troops hammered the Confederates on their front. A little before noon it was the Confederates' turn to do some running. They ran southward across the Warrenton Pike, in some disorder but not broken, and formed a new line on the crest of a hill named for a family farm, Henry House Hill. There they were joined by Wade Hampton's South Carolina command and two regiments under Colonel Francis S. Bartow. On them depended the Confederate left and in all probability the Confederate army. 
On Lookout Hill, Beauregard and Johnston were trying to read the battle mainly from the racket of musketry and the rising clouds of smoke and dust. Johnston was Beauregard's senior, but because he had arrived too late to review the terrain and disposition of troops, Beauregard held the field command. Although they were both men of prickly pride, they worked together well this day. First, Beauregard surrendered to an inevitable conclusion. The flank attack he had planned on McDowell's left was not going to happen, and the troops he had intended for it would be urgently needed for a counter-strike on the Union right. Second, and more dramatic, Joe Johnston, listening to the roar from that direction, said simply, The battle is over there. I am going, and rode toward Henry House Hill. Beauregard remained briefly to order more troops from his right to his left, and hurried himself toward the hill. Before either of them could reach the hill, however, the five regiments of Thomas J. Jackson's Virginia Brigade would be forming up on its crest. On Henry House Hill, McDowell was making the weight of his 10,000 felt, and he had another 8,000 across the run who had not yet managed to get into the fight. The 6,000 rebels who pushed back against that weight were in a good deal of trouble. Evans's command looked to be shot up and fought out. B's brigade was slowly and stubbornly collapsing toward the rear. Bartow waved a flag and shouted to his two Georgia regiments, General Beauregard says you must hold this position. Georgians, I appeal to you to hold on. A moment later he was killed by a mini-ball. Meanwhile, Beauregard himself had reached the hill, and while trying to firm up his line, was soon unhorsed but unhurt by a Federal artillery shell. General B. rode to the crest of the hill where Jackson stood with his Virginians. General, they are beating us back, he said. Jackson, with an icy, almost eerie ferocity he carried into combat, replied, Sir, we will give them the bayonet. B. returned to his brigade, and then, just moments from eternity himself, gave Jackson an immortal name. Waving his sword, he called out, Look, there is Jackson, standing like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. It is a poetic moment worthy of Shakespeare's Prince Harry at Agincourt, but one dissenting opinion is worth noting. Jackson's brigade was actually a little behind the crest of the hill, at least one witness in the fog of battle on Henry House Hill understood B, seeing Jackson not advancing to his aid, to say, Look at Jackson standing there like a damn stone wall. What B really meant went to his grave with him, for shortly thereafter a bullet tore through his abdomen and killed him. Still, poetry aside, Jackson's brigade did stand, and ever after he would be Stonewall Jackson and his brigade, the Stonewall Brigade. But McDowell was not done on Henry House Hill. By the middle of the afternoon, he had four brigades in line for another push. Most of these men had been marching and fighting since two o'clock that morning, and by this time were hot, hungry, thirsty, and tired. When the assault commenced, it went forward in pieces by regiments, and never hit with concerted and concentrated force. Nor did it receive any help from the remainder of Tyler's division that still faced the stone bridge. To support the infantry assault, McDowell ordered two batteries of regular artillery forward to a piece of high ground just south of the Henry House. As they went forward, they ran into a sharp fire of musketry from Confederates behind the Henry House, and in their attempt to drive the rebels off, they sent shells into the house itself. The mistress of the house was Mrs. Judith Henry, a bedridden, 84-year-old widow. Her sons had taken her once to safety, but she begged to return. If she were to die that day, she wanted to die in her own home. Just as her sons returned her to her bed, a shell killed her instantly. She was older than the Constitution and no one knew what her political sympathies were, but she was among the casualties of war to be numbered along Bull Run. Now Federal infantry went forward to support the exposed artillerymen. 
They were a regiment of gaudy New York fire zouaves, in scarlet trousers, blue tunics, and white turbans, and a battalion of brand-new Marines, recruits who had been Marines just three weeks. Just as they were forming up, Jeb Stuart came riding in from the valley with a regiment of cavalry. Confusing the fire zouaves for a unit of Alabama zouaves, Stuart rode nearly into them before discovering his mistake, whereupon he immediately charged, driving eastward up the Warrenton Pike and scattering the Yankees wildly to the rear. The Union batteries, now entirely unsupported, were exposed to murderous rifle fire. A Confederate regiment in blue uniforms came forward. The war was but two months old. Some rebels wore blue, some Federals cadet gray. When Federal gunners mistakenly held their fire, the rebels in blue delivered a volley at seventy yards. A Union officer remembered that it seemed as though every man and horse of that battery just lay down and died right off. All along the crest of Henry House Hill, Union and Confederate infantry continued hammering away at each other, but Beauregard and Johnston's men were beginning to feel that the crisis there had passed. From the Confederate right, Jubal Early's brigade arrived and formed on Jackson's left. Then the last of Joe Johnston's four valley brigades, Kirby Smith's, marched up to form on Early's left. The Federal attempt to envelop the Confederate left had now definitely failed, and their own right was overlapped and threatened. The Federal spirit to keep up the fight was wilting also, as exhausted men saw fresh troops forming in the enemy's line while none of their own reserves appeared. About 3.30 they made one more weary lunge at the hill. Jackson instructed his troops, Hold your fire until they're on you, then fire and give them the bayonet. And when you charge, yell like furies. Down the slope now they came, firing and filling the air with a strange, tremulous cry, part foxhound's bay and part foxhunter's call. It was the first time the rebel yell was heard on the field of battle. The Federals wavered, faltered, then broke. It was at first a retreat, slow and sullen, the men feeling more betrayed by official incompetence than fairly beaten. Betrayed! Sold out, they told each other. They had been in a crucible of fire and smoke, sweat and blood for more than twelve hours. They had endured all they could for one day. Just as telling, their organization was very nearly unraveled. At this point, Kirby Smith's brigade, fresh from the valley, came forward to press the issue. It was joined by Jubal Early's brigade, which had done some marching that day, but not much fighting yet. With a cheer, they came smashing down on McDowell's right flank. From that blow onward, it was a confused and chaotic foot race back to the Potomac for the Federals. The rout was on. McDowell, who had come so close to a handsome victory himself, now made a last desperate effort to keep defeat from becoming disaster. He got two brigades from his left and a third from his reserve at Alexandria in line near Centerville, hoping to reform and resist the counterattack. But the Confederates could hardly have made a more determined or effective assault on that blue line than the broken pieces of McDowell's army did. They carried their sweaty panic with them and transmitted it with electric suddenness. Whatever they had been as an organized fighting force an hour before, they were now so many thousands of individual wills bent on a single object, the safety of Washington. The road leading back to Fairfax Courthouse in Washington was fairly chaotic even before the rout. Thousands of curious civilians, congressmen and their ladies, journalists, had all ridden out to see the rebellion crushed, crowding roads already jammed with ambulances carrying wounded from the field and wagons carrying ammunition to the front. When thousands of soldiers, shouting, We are whipped! Go back! We are whipped! washed over them in the dark, the result was a palpably real nightmare. In the road was an English journalist, William Howard Russell of the London Times, who left a vivid description of the scene between Cub Run Bridge and Fairfax Courthouse. 
infantry soldiers on mules and draft horses with harness clinging to their heels, as much frightened as their riders, negro servants on their master's chargers, ambulances crowded with unwounded soldiers, a shouting, screaming mass of men on foot who were literally yelling with rage at every halt and shrieking out, Here are the cavalry! Will you get on? Heat, dust, imprecations inconceivable. Russell stopped one junior officer and asked about the fate of the army. The officer, whose scabbard was empty, didn't really know, and at that point didn't much care. They can stay that like. I know I'm going home. I've had enough fighting to last my lifetime. In the end, at least one thing was clear. While it had taken a full three days for McDowell to get his army down to the banks of Bull Run, what was left of it got back to Washington in 24 hours. About the same time as the rebel counterattack got off, the man who had arrived at the critical moment at the critical place, Jackson, was himself a witness to how hot a place it was. A ball went through his coat, another into his horse, and a third snapped a finger of his left hand. Unshaken, he went to the rear to have his wound attended to. There he met Jefferson Davis. Davis, of course, had approached the fight from the rear, from the railroad at Manassas. All old soldiers tell the same story. Approach any fight from the rear, and the victors and the vanquished look more or less alike. Davis, in fact, seeing so many fearful Confederate stragglers, thought the day was lost, sure that fields are not won where men desert the colors as ours are doing. From horseback near a field hospital he tried to rally the troops. I am President Davis! Follow me back to the field! Jackson relieved the anxiety of his commander-in-chief. We have whipped them, he shouted. They ran like sheep. Give me five thousand fresh men, and I will be in Washington City tomorrow. It was a bold enough boast, but no more than a boast. For one thing, there were no five thousand fresh troops to be had anywhere. For another, the Confederates were, as Joe Johnston said, more disorganized by their victory than the Federals were by defeat. There was pursuit briefly, some units getting as far as a mile or two beyond Bull Run. A rebel battery galloped up the Warrenton Pike and unlimbered a gun. As it happened, fierce, old, fire-eating Edmund Ruffin, reputed to have fired that first shot at Sumter, was on hand. The gunners gave him another opportunity to shoot at the vile Yankee race, and he sent the shell flying toward Federals running toward Cub Run. But the wreckage of McDowell's army didn't require any encouragement. Later, in his battle report, McDowell observed tactfully that many of the volunteers did not wait for authority to proceed to the Potomac, but left on their own decision. The soldiers simply remembered the long way home as the Great Skedaddle. News of the victory at the Battle of Manassas was the occasion of rapturous joy throughout the South. But in their wild rapture was something wildly unrealistic. Many Confederates carried into the conflict the cavalier notion that one true Southron could whip ten Yankee hirelings, or twenty-five or a hundred, depending on who was doing the puffing. For those so persuaded, the triumph at Manassas was a self-evident confirmation. It was a point of view that turned a blind eye to the fact that the numbers engaged were virtually equal, and that the Yankee hirelings had in truth come within one hard blow of winning the field themselves. Further, the casualty lists might have told Southerners something significant about the Yankee will to fight. McDowell's army lost about 625 killed and nearly a thousand wounded. Beauregard's 400 killed and 1,600 wounded. Except for the 1,200 Yankees captured, most of these lost in the collapse on their right, losses were fairly even. But triumph is an intoxicating brew. Edmund Ruffin thought the battle virtually the close of the war, and that Beauregard should march immediately on Philadelphia and burn it to the ground. Georgia politician Thomas R. Cobb was convinced that Manassas was one of the decisive battles of the world, 
and Southern independence was secure. Mary Chestnut, however, was among the few Southerners to take a sterner look at their victory. This battle, she confided to her diary, lulls us into a fool's paradise of conceit, while it will wake every inch of the enemy's manhood. There is no question that northern manhood and morale had been badly shaken by Bull Run. Horace Greeley, so instrumental in urging Lincoln on to aggressive action, now wrote the President, On every brow sits sullen, scorching, black despair. If it is best for the country and for mankind that we make peace with the rebels and on their own terms, do not shrink even from that. But despite Greeley's despair, northern spirit was shaken, not broken. One of Greeley's own Tribune editors wrote that Americans do not sit despondently after a defeat. Reverses, though stunning at first, by their recoil stimulate and quicken to unwonted exertion. Let us go to work, then, with a will. As for Lincoln, he said simply, The fat is in the fire now. Then he went to work with a will. In the week following Bull Run, he began to identify immediate strategic goals and signed two bills for the enlistment of a million three-year men. He also sent an order to the mountains of West Virginia, where General George B. McClellan had won some minor victories that had been much celebrated by the press and by himself. To McClellan, Lincoln wired, Come hither without delay. <laughs> 